From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 120, recorded on November 9th, 2016. episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and with me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Welcome Hello, back. Daniel. <laughs> Welcome back, Daniel. I mean, uh, Dixon. Yes. You missed our last episode. Yeah, I know. I felt badly about that. No, I don't, don't feel badly. I did. But we all feel badly today. I was ensconced in the middle of Bolivia. Well, that's a nice title. Ensconced in the middle of Bolivia. <laughs> yes. Do they have uh, parasites? Today? Oh, my gosh. What's the prevalent they? one? Well, uh, we're going to talk about one today, actually, on a paper. Are we? We are. Uh, that's the one, Reduvido one, right? So that's the one. That is the one. But they've got oh, their fair share of malaria. Leishmania? Leishmania? They've got lots of Leishmania. Malaria? And, yep. Zika? Maybe. They do a butt up against Brazil. They're, they are mosquitoes, right? Yeah. It's hot and tropical? In part of it. Have, you, be, have part, you been to Bolivia? I have never been to Bolivia. Oh. <clears throat> the other part of it is in the Andes, really up high. So yeah, like, no mosquitoes up there. No. Okay, so Leishmania, malaria. T. cruzi. Cruzi, lots of toxoplasma, of course. Everybody's got toxic worms. Worms. We don't even talk about worms because they're so common. <laughs> Amoeba. Yeah. Yeah. Strongyloides. Sure. And uh, schistosomes. Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that. When you went, you must have felt at home. I think you? no, because <laughs> the schistosomiasis endemic centers in South America on the east coast of Brazil. Okay. Well, Dixon, now we have a case, which we did last time, and we'll let Daniel describe it and see if you can figure out what it is. (laughs) Well, I actually did read this on the show notes, so I'm a little bit ahead of her curve. You did. But but I want to hear it in person. All right. So did you read people's um, submitted emails, and that's how you figured it out? I I took an average. I took an average. (laughs) (laughs) You crowdsourced this. I crowdsourced, that's right. Yeah, they're all the same, aren't they? They are. Now, this one, as I said last time, was um, a kindler and gentler case. We went back to Thailand. Um, but I mentioned this this could occur in several different locales in the world. Right. Um, or a bunch not too far southwest of where Dixon recently was that I was um, yeah. acquainted with, shall I say. <laughs> um, but here we have a 25-year-old Thai woman from Bangkok. She comes to the hospital with a chief complaint of facial swelling. She eats the typical Thai diet, as we've discussed in previous episodes, with sum tam and lots of fish that is not particularly well cooked. (laughs) Um, She says that this facial swelling is migratory. It seems to be moving around her face. Um, It's not tender, but there is a little bit of itchiness. Um, And I I did actually mention to Vincent that, you know, one thing that was unique about this case is often people with this um, presentation describe a lancinating pain, which she does not describe, right? Mm. This is a real case. She didn't read the textbook. Right. Um, now, for about a week, this has been going on. Um, otherwise, she is healthy, no prior medical or surgical problems. Family's all fine. She's HIV negative. Um, no toxic habits, as we like to say. <laughs> right. Um, no, uh, no alcohol, tobacco, things like that. No drugs. Um, and she hasn't traveled to other, you know, she's just been in this local area. An examination, uh, she's got this swelling on the right side. It's about three to four centimeter area. Uh, a little bit of redness. It's firm, but doesn't feel uh, fluctuate. We don't feel like there's a fluid pocket there um, or an abscess. No fever, no GI problems. Uh, we, we did actually, I think I threw in at the end, her white cat was up a little bit, wow. and she had eosinophilia. Right. She had increased numbers of eosinophils in the right. peripheral. Well, Dixon, uh-huh. we didn't have a lot of answers on the last episode when D- daniel and i were sad right yes we were sad and uh, <laughs> this time this time we got a lot we did the first one's from frederick greetings to you all not to worry vincent and daniel i think you did a good job of balancing the gravitas 
slash levity. Nice. As I think someone said we're too serious, right? Yes, that's what I had heard. The <laughs> really? So we tried to work on that. Yeah. I am the Swedish equivalent of a resident in pediatrics at the University Hospital of Northern Sweden. Northern Sweden. Found your podcast family initially via TWIP in, the, in its early Parasitology 101 era and have since widened the perspective to include TWIV and occasionally TWIVO. I'm not a scientist, but a, as a practitioner of medicine, it is, of course, valuable to keep a foothold in the basic science of an ever-expanding universe of biomedical knowledge. I also greatly respect your endeavors to apply the ideals of scientific reasoning in the intersection of your own scientific expertise and public opinion, most obviously perhaps in TWIV, exemplified, for instance, by the two viral epidemics you have covered as they unfolded. Adding a depth and complexity, it doesn't seem possible for traditional media to capture neither scientific media nor news media. The integrity of those ideals is, in fact, the gravitas from which your levity can spring, even if the entertainment that offers <laughs> can be a bit nerdy at times. Ooh. He's absolutely right that Ooh. the med traditional media could not cover these things with the complexity that we do. No. One of the, and, and being called nerdy is now a compliment. It is. It's a, now uh, very in to be a nerd. Most most prescribed shows have time limits. Ours is open ended. <laughs> yeah, why do they have time limits? Because the producers are screaming fifteen exactly minutes. Right. You got it. You got it. They don't pay for that sponsorship. You don't get the time. Now you can open up our listeners coming back as maybe you need to introduce time limits. <laughs> right. <laughs> Enjoying as much as everyone else in the case study, I have been on the verge of submitting answers previously, but something or other has gotten in the way. Was there a bit of a giveaway in the presentation of the answer to last week's case, or am I mistaken? My guess, based on the symptoms and the geographical distribution of the pathogen, is nathostomiasis. The disease is usually self-limiting. But apparently, on rare occasions, there can be migration to non-cutaneous locales, ocular, neurological, which would present more acute indication for treatment. Traditionally, surgical excision of accessible larvae is the standard of care, but albendazole or possibly ivermectin seems to be gaining evidence as an adjunct for non-cutaneous disease. Radical surgery may not be possible here. Repeated treatment courses of anti-helminthics may be required. Regards, Frederick from Umea. Sweden. Have you been to Umea, Dixon? No. I haven't been to northern Sweden. I've been to the middle part and the southern part. Daniel, can you take the next one? David writes, Dear TWIP team, after a brief respite from answering case studies for TWIP, but carefully listening nonetheless, I thought this particular case would be a fortunate opportunity to relapse into the habit of weekly parasitic pontificating. <laughs> <laughs> Upon searching the World Wide Web, a search on migratory facial swelling was sufficient. I found a parasitic nematode that fits the bill quite nicely. Nathostoma spinigerum. Can you pronounce that for me there, Dixon? Did I do okay? Spinigerum. Spinigerum. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> this organism has an interesting multi-host life cycle. Eggs hatch in fresh water and release L1 larvae, which are eaten by copepods or water fleas. These copepods are eaten by small fish, which are eventually consumed by a carnivorous species, such as a dog or cat. As the larvae develop into the L2 and L3 stages, the L3 larvae in the carnivore bore through the stomach, Oof. migrate about the body for about three months, and then strangely return to the stomach and attach to the gastric mucosa, where they mature six months later. The eggs are carried through the feces into fresh water, where the life cycle begins again. Humans, however, are an accidental host for this parasite, and the larvae continuously wander through the body, stimulating immune response until they die. A human can either drink water infested with infected copepods or upon consumption of raw fish, introduce the larvae into the human body. This organism is endemic to Southeast Asia, which fits this patient's geographic range and has been known to stem from consumption of raw fish dishes that Thailand or other Southeastern Asian countries are known for. Current treatment for this parasite includes primarily albendazole and strangely other anti-helminth drugs such as thiabendazole and metronidazole have been seen to work experimentally. I wonder why this organism is only susceptible so far to albendazole. Oh. Currently, a chilly 39 degrees F in North Grofton, Massachusetts. And as the chills of winter approach, I will quote the inimitable Roald Dahl. And they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing. All the best, David P., PhD student, Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, Molecular Helminthology nice. Laboratory. 
That's a good place. You like that molecular helminthology? I do, I do. I like that very much, as a matter of fact. Please take the next one, Dixon. It would be my pleasure. Christine writes, The weather today in Brisbane, Australia, is currently 23C, with expectations of a lovely 30-degree spring day to come. My guess for the diagnosis is that the patient is suffering from anathostomiasis. Anathostomiasis is a foodborne parasitic infection that results from the human ingestion of the third stage larvae of nematodes within the genus Nathostoma. The most common species that infects humans is Nathostoma spinagerium. Human infections are also caused by a G. hispidium, G. nipponicum, G. procyonus, that's the one that infects raccoons, by the way, G. binucleatum, and G. dolorosi. <clears throat> Isn't that your wife's name? It's no, she's not Dolores. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not your wife's name. <laughs> it's somebody's last name, that's for sure, or first name. Nathostomiasis is called by other terms in different countries worldwide, such as <laughs> chokofusu, tau, chid, or chokofishi in Japan, uh, consular disease, Nanjing, Shanghai, rheumatism, Tao Chid in Thailand, Woodbury Bug in Australia, and Yangtze River edema <laughs> in China. The larvae uh, have been found in raw or undercooked protein food sources, for example, freshwater fish, chickens, snails, snakes, frogs, pigs, or in contaminated water. In rare instances, larvae can directly penetrate the skin of individuals who are exposed to contaminated food sources or fresh water. Any organ system can be involved, but the most common manifestation of infection is localized intermittent migratory swelling in the skin and subcutaneous tissues. Such swelling may be painful, puritic, and or erythematous. In addition, nathostoma species commonly cause a parasitic eosinophilic meningitis due to larval, depos- larval migration into the CNS. Systemic infection is typically associated with peripheral eosinophilia, in which the percentage of eosinophils may exceed 50% of the circulating white blood cells. A classic triad that indicates infection is patient complaint of intermittent migratory swelling, predominance of eosinophilia in laboratory tests, and report of travel or residence in nathostomiasis endemic areas, mainly Southeast Asia. It is written on Medscape that the only definitive a treatment is surgical removal of the worm, which is possible only when it is accessible. However, it also states, although surgical removal, when possible, is the treatment of choice in nathostomiasis, albendazole appears to have an increasing role in complementing surgical re- intervention. Ivermectin in a single dose is better tolerated than albendazole, but may be less effective. Mebendazole, which was formerly used, has variable results. And due to significant toxicities, should no longer be used. Adjunctive corticoid therapy as an anti-inflammatory may have a role in the treatment of CNS disease, end quotes. Thank you for your ongoing efforts with TWIV, TWIP, TWIM, TWIVO, and Urban Ag. Look forward to each episode, and I'm looking forward to updating my copy of Parasitic Diseases. Christine from Brisbane, as they pronounce it, Australia. Very good. (laughs) Dr. Wink writes, according to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, thanks, I will be sure to donate both Nathostoma spinigerum and Paragonimus westermani infect ties eating raw fish dishes and may cause subcutaneous swelling. My intuition is to say Paragonimiasis because it is more common, so I'll go back to Nathostoma. Stomiasis for my guest because my intuition is often wrong. <laughs> Wink, Weinberg, Daniel. Mo writes, Dear Twippers, I'm a junior doctor from the UK and a recent convert to the Microbe World Church. I am currently <laughs> undertaking the East African Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, oh, nice. a collaboration between the London School, University of Washington, and Johns Hopkins, plus the host institutions, Kilimanjaro, Christian Medical University College, Tanzania, and Makerere University, Uganda. 
I would highly recommend it to anyone listening. It's fantastic. I started listening to TWIP during our parasitology module on the recommendation of an old friend with whom I was reacquainted on the course. And I've really enjoyed your insights and discussions. The cases have also been very helpful in putting the knowledge from class into a real context. Given your lack of responses last week, I feel this is a good time to put what I have learned to the test and come up with a diagnosis. The relatively short history of migratory facial swellings associated with itchiness, possible preceding GI upset, eosinophilia, and a history of raw fish consumption in Thailand got me thinking about tapeworms and tissue nematodes. Working through the China mnemonic, I think we can pretty confidently say it's a helminth. Not least because of the name of the podcast. <laughs> My differential diagnosis is one, cutaneous nathostomiasis, most likely caused by nathostoma spinigerum, the triad of migratory swellings, eosinophilia, and living in an area where the zoonotic infection is endemic makes it the most likely diagnosis for me. Humans usually become infected by eating raw or inadequately cooked freshwater fish or other intermediate hosts such as snakes, frogs, and chickens. With the lesions on the face, this woman would be at risk of CNS or ocular involvement, which could be catastrophic. In a case I learned about recently, the parasite eventually came out of the patient's nose. And with some quick thinking and a Google check of the composition of normal saline, it was kept alive so the diagnosis could be made macroscopically. In this case, diagnosis would be made by serology, I think. Treatment will be needed if it doesn't make its own way out. And although surgical remover would have been needed in the past, I believe albendazole or ivermectin would be effective. She should probably cook her fish in the future. Mm. Two, sparginosis caused by spirometra species. I think this will cause a similar pattern of disease and again comes from consuming undercooked fish, frogs, or the infected copepods. However, this seems a less likely diagnosis. Excising the nodule would treat this infection and allow you to make a diagnosis. Hopefully I've got this one right, not least because I've been telling all my classmates to listen to TWIP. If not, I look forward to finding out the diagnosis and hope my thoughts were not ridiculous. <laughs> all the best, and thanks for all the work you do. Mo. P.S. My friend who recommended the podcast has an almost unearthly affection and idolization of Dr. Griffin. And so, if he could say a quick hello to Rebecca, I'm sure she would be very <laughs> grateful and really annoyed at me. Thanks. Well... Hello, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the word is unhealthy, not unearthly. <laughs> no, did I, <laughs> did I say? You did. <laughs> you said unearthly. Okay, right. so Jeff writes, Hello, Twip Triumvirate, uh, in parens, assuming Dixon is back, and yes, I am. A much easier case this week, although I have to say that I enjoyed the more difficult ones. Even when I am wrong, I end up learning something. I believe the patient in Thailand is infected with nasostoma spinigerum, as it is consistent with a firm... Facial swelling that is migrating and linked to raw slash undercooked seafood, especially swamp eel, <laughs> doesn't sound appetizing, he writes, but it probably is. I would be interested to hear if surgical excision is still considered primary treatment with albendazole available. So he wants to know whether or not if you had albendazole on the ready, would you still elect to do surgery rather than give a drug? Well, only if this is the right answer will we answer that question, right? <laughs> right. We will delay gratification <laughs> for... Hang in there, Jeff. Revealing if, if the you're correct right. answer. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Mike writes, OMG, is that a stack of buzz saws on its head? Oh, <laughs> hooklets encircling the cephalic bulb. Never mind. Of course, I am referring to the inimitable nematode, nanthostoma spinigerum, eager to blaze a meandering trail through your body, and in this patient's case, through the face, resulting in non-pitting swelling. Oof. Oh, and don't forget the pruritus and eosinophilia. She most likely picked it up from eating raw, raw freshwater fish or other raw delicacies such as eel, frog, bird, and snake. Yum. If there's one thing I've learned from Lord Chris Lip, who also happens to play a professional chef on the internet, uh -huh. is that all food should be deep fried or at least <laughs> heavily dosed with microwaves. Right. And I thought this was going to be a kinder and gentler case. Mike from Oregon. Maybe kinder and gentler to our listeners, but not necessarily for this poor young one. Right. Yeah, that was because it was going to be easier for them. Right? Easy, easier for them, but not easier for her. All right. No. Here, take Alan's, please. Is that me? Alan writes, Dear Dr. Twip, 
Still love following your family of podcasts, though I'm disappointed I've not finished the last few episodes in time to make a guess of the case study. I, too, am a fan of Thai pickled fish sauces. Pla Som and Pla Ra, although most familiar with the Cambodia National Institution of Parahak in soups as a dipping sauce and on bread. Yum. Always interested in traditional food preservation practices. I had heard that prahak was safe from parasites after three months of fermentation, <laughs> but know that some like a vintage of two to three years. Do you all know how long it would be considered safe? Might be an interesting study. We did some similar studies at Tulane in the early 90s to see if the citrus juice curing of ceviche in chili was sufficient to protect it from cholera. It was in our trials, and we looked at what dipping sauces would be adequate to protect crawfish. Of course, we had no personal interest in the findings. <laughs> I enjoyed your case study on Thai liver flukes, Opus thorcus viverini, a pervasive problem in northern Thailand. But I think if one of you commented you were glad we didn't have them in the U.S. We do, at least here in Hawaii, Fasciola gigantica and Stellantchasmus falcatus, especially with a growing public interest in organic watercress. Oh. <clears throat> Regarding this week's case of the Thai patient with facial swelling... It sounds a lot like nathostomiasis, nathostoma spinogerum infection, a larval nematode common in Southeast Asia acquired by eating raw or undercooked fish and humans non-definitive host causing non-pitting, creeping eruption or wandering swelling. If it is G. spinogerum, then to badly quote Alec Guinness, we are not the carnivores it was looking for. <laughs> G. spinogerum is a multi-host parasite whose eggs hatch in fresh water and the larvae are eaten by cyclops water fleas, which are in turn eaten by fish, which the parasite hopes will be eaten by almost any member of the canine or feline families, plus probably pigs. Over some nine months, the larvae bore through the storage and eventually attached to the gastric mucosa, allowing their eggs to be passed back into the environment in the host species starting the cycle over again. In humans, albendazole seems generally effective as a treatment. Thanks for your podcast. P.S. Last week's case was great. I remember a couple of years ago about a case I saw of Dientomy bifragilis and Blastocystis hominis All right. in a family cluster I saw here on the Big Island, probably contracted from exposure to pig feces as hunters. But still, I didn't think of it for the case study. <laughs> I missed Dixon's gracious humor and enthusiasm for related factoids last week. He's gloating over here next to me, all happy. Thank you for that. And we haven't had an article in a while on the fascinating macro effects of parasites as TWIP has been famous for. Things like parasitic causes of host behavior change and related environmental changes like stream depth, etc. <laughs> Best regards, Alan Robbins, Kalua, Kona, Hawaii. Yeah, we, we should do one of those macro papers again, Dixon. We've, been, we've been molecular lately. You're right. And we're going to continue in that theme, of course, but uh, we, we will uh, endeavor to uh, open it up to a more ecologically broadened audience. And everyone got the Obi-Wan, the Obi-Wan <laughs> reference did, there. <laughs> we are yeah. not the corner. Wow, a lot more. <laughs> right. Dixon, you're next. Brian writes. Pick up the pace. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hello, Team Twip. I love the show and have been listening to all the Twixes series for some time now. I'm an undergraduate studying zoology at Southern Illinois University. I will happily graduate in May of 2017. I only bring up that because I am not because I am not on parasitology, professionally speaking, with any of you, but that's the great thing about your show. Anyone can participate. My guess for the 25-year-old Thai female is nathostomiasis. I don't remember covering this organism in my parasitology lab, so I was initially at a loss but I have learned the basics of research, and with very minimal digging, I, derived, I arrived at nathostoma infection. Not exactly sure which species, and I'm going to do, <clears throat> and I am doing this, doing this, doing this while at work, and thank you for filling that in, and on my smartphone, so please forgive grammar. But forgiven. <laughs> Don't worry, I have trouble with that too. Uh, keep them coming, and as always, thanks for great content across all three shows. I truly enjoy them. Layla writes, Hello, TWIP team. I've listened to your discussions for quite a while, but this is my first foray into the cases for the young woman with facial swelling. I'm going to venture a guess of nantho nathostomiasis. The nematode larvae can infect people when they eat raw or undercooked fish or other meat like chicken, so it matches with her exposure history. 
The parasite cannot mature in humans, but the larvae bury around, burrow around through tissue and cause all sorts of problems. I got most of my information from the CDC page where it says that people with an infection on their face are at higher risk for serious complications of the central nervous system. I found myself interested in the various names for nathostomiasis like Yangtze edema, but it seems this parasite was relatively rare, so there isn't much on the history behind the alternative names available on the Internet. I also downloaded your book at Parasites Without Borders. I'm a postdoc in molecular biology, RNA secondary structure, so I might be a dead-end host, but I really enjoy your podcast. <laughs> Thank you for all your hard work. It's very good, right? It's very good. Excellent. Yes. Uh, Trudy writes, Dear Twippers, I have to admit that in my case, Daniel was definitely right in saying that the reason I don't send in my guesses for your case studies is that I'm ashamed of my profound ignorance, <clears throat> and I am definitely afraid of failure. However, with Stuart Firestein as my inspiration for overcoming these paralyzing obstacles to success, I will finally venture a guess on last week's case study. I hypothesize that the lady with the wandering facial swelling is infected with nathostoma spinigerum. My goodness. A parasitic nematode that is acquired by eating raw or undercooked fish and meat. Thank you, Google and Wikipedia. Yours truly, <laughs> Trudy. Nice. Niraj writes, Dear Twipologists, my diagnosis for this latest case presented by Dr. Griffin is that of facial nathostomiasis in the Thai female. Nathostomiasis is caused by a roundworm, nathostoma spinigerum. The symptoms presented closely align with the pathology observed due to this parasite. I hope I am right in my diagnosis, as I am really interested in getting the PDF of the parasitic diseases for my kind reference. You can get it free. You don't well, need to we get joked. this right. And in fact, we joked. <laughs> yeah, we joked that wrong, if they got it right, they could get a PDF. But you know what? If you get it wrong, even if you don't submit, you still get a free PDF. No, if you get it wrong, <laughs> then you really need the PDF. <laughs> Overall, I must say, I really enjoy these podcasts and so solely missed having Dr. DePommier's insightful answers to the questions that were posed. Please continue to do the noble work, and I look forward to learning more about the parasites I didn't even know existed. Best. Niraj from Sutrovax. Sutrovax. Okay, from Sutrovax. A colleague of the almost always right Jeff. Whose letter was a few letters up. They wrote separately. They should have. They did read, write separately. They probably could have collaborated. Chris B. writes, Hello, professors. I don't want you to mistake the lack of emails on the case studies as a lack of interest. So here's my guess. Nanthostomiasis. After consulting with Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition, which I downloaded from ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, and checking with the CDC's website, an infection with Nanthostoma spingerum seems to fit the clinical presentation, geographical location, and eating habits described in the most recent case study. Migratory subcutaneous lesions, which are described as firm, that are accompanied by redness edema, but not necessarily pain, are commonly associated with nathostomiasis. Humans generally encounter these worms as a result of eating raw or undercooked freshwater fish that are harboring the third, star, the third stage larvae. <laughs> you know those financial ads? <laughs> you have to, they yeah, talk really exactly. fast at the end. A biopsy of the facial lesion could potentially isolate the actual parasite, which could then be identified via microscopy. However, an ELISA analysis of the sample seems to be the choice method by which nathostomiasis can be diagnosed. Both albendazole and ivermectin have been effective treatments. Thank you all for the... Fantastic podcast. It keeps getting better and better each time. Best, Chris, Dietrich Lab, Columbia University. I right. raised this, the, the uh, pitch of my voice. <laughs> we have a ton left. Holy crap. Yeah. Now, that was actually bringing back memories for me because, you know, Vincent, I actually listened to your, what was it, your Virology 101. Oh, at 2x uh, speed. And I at 2x <laughs> speed. <laughs> and my kids in the car always complain, Daddy, why do you listen to all the podcasts at 2x? And the I'm three like, I'm <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Alvin so, and... So now I felt like, oh, this is the Vincent I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Right. You know, we can't complain in both directions. We don't get responses or we get too many responses. I'm not, have, compl I'm not complaining. We, we can't just, have too many responses. We were just talking. We were just talking. Okay. David writes, dear Twip Master. See, I, I just Twip keep them masters. coming. <laughs> <laughs> Having just listened to the latest TWIP episode 119, I decided to write in partly because eosinophilia cases are a clear delimitator, and for that reason make me feel at least reasonably safe regarding my judgment, and also because it's somehow frustrating that on several occasions my guesses turned out to be right and I missed my chance to shine <laughs> in the parallel TWIP universe right. because the next episode became available already. <laughs> <laughs> or the lady from Bangkok with the migratory facial swelling, my guess is Nathostoma spinigerum because it causes facial swelling, 
through cutaneous larvae migraines is endemic in Thailand and is caused by the eating of raw fish. I gladly refer to page 321 of Parasitic Diseases for further information. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for the free online distribution of this work. Ever since a mention of it was made about 10 episodes ago, I wondered how I would ever be able to lay my hand on the goodie. <laughs> now it has come as an early Christmas present, and it is a great stimulus to stay on top of the cases. I doubt whether I will read it in the digital format, given that I spent my working days looking at computer screens writing applications. I dislike on-screen reading about as much as I love the full physical appearance of a book. As a hard copy is also favorably priced for a work of this magnitude and beauty, I would like to buy it, but I am not sure you will ship it outside the U.S., in my case, to Nicaragua. While this may not be a guarantee for reading, at least I know that the presence of the book will inspire me and my daughters to look at the pictures. Wow. And after using the digital version to make an estimated guess for case studies, we could use the hard copy for bedtime stories. Writing to you from Nicaragua with a midnight temperature of 25 C, I salute you most sincerely, David. And I will say, David and everyone else who's outside the U.S., we will ship this book anywhere in the world because right. I think our mission, right, is to get knowledge to the people that need it the most. And here, here. we're not going to let shipping charges stand between you and a copy not. of our book. No, we won't. I, I highly recommend uh, rethinking the bedtime story part of all that, though, because I think you can freak out a lot of people when you show them some of these pictures. Well, this is what I read to my kids. Yeah, well, I, remember, my son dressed up remember. as a guinea worm for his show and tell a couple months ago. So Some of them are really graphic. Some are pretty graphic. So we, we just have to warn the reader ahead of time that, you know. I, we should put that in the front. We if you turn like that certain page. Certain ages for each different parasite well, and... Maybe a verbal <laughs> description would do just as well, you know, like cavitary lesion with large white object in the middle. Yeah, that's true. It's not the same as seeing this large Dracunculus metanensis exiting now, from the Um rights. Okay. Um rights. Dear Twip professors, if you come to if you come to Thailand last month, you will see a lot of people with slightly swollen eyes. This had nothing to do with parasites. People were crying, me included. Because our beloved king passed away on October 13th. And I've been to your beloved country when he was still alive, and I can attest to the fact that he was a well-loved person. And um, I I also feel your loss and um, wish that um, that the country transitions into the next phase of their life peacefully. For 70 years, <clears throat> our king worked so hard helping his people, especially farmers and the poor. The government will mourn for one year, so everywhere you go, you will see people dressed in black. I believe the royal cremation will be held sometime late next year. Back to the case. I think the lady with swollen face has nathostomiasis, written in capital letters so that we will not miss seeing that. The worm probably crawled under her skin and resulted in tissue inflammation. She probably got it from consuming the raw fish that is the third stage larvae embedded in the meat. I believe this parasite is rather difficult to treat. Surgical removal of the worm can be tricky, and albendazole is not 100% effective. As a side comment, the life cycle of this worm was discovered by two Thai researchers back in 1950s. One of them became the Minister of Public Health around 1960. The other one became the Dean of Maidol University Medical School around the same time. Keep up the good work. We missed you, Dixon. Well, I missed you guys, too. You're not done with the letter, dude. Well, I can't. I have to scroll up. You don't know how to scroll? He's got to do it for you? Yeah, currently, it is 30 degrees Celsius, and we are about to have an evening shower. Mr. Um Peyratakul, Bangkok. Peyratakul. Peyratakul. I forgot the ta. <laughs> what is the matter with you? I've got a little thing here. I just got back from Bolivia, and I'm... I was in La Paz. And what do you he, think he has, Dixon? Uh, yeah, Daniel? Dixon, Daniel. <laughs> sorry, I'm no, really I have, sorry. Um, I'm no, I was letting, telling him I thought it was Halzoon, right? I'm trying to get rid of my I'm, I'm looking for some parasite, but unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, this, yeah. is a, this is an environmentally induced uh, cough that a lot of people in that city had, unfortunately. All right, we have uh, four or five left. We will do this. We we'll do, do this. it. We'll do it. And this is great. Thank you for responding after we, we cried. Exactly. Jarrett writes, hello, all regarding the case of the Thai woman with migratory swelling in her face, my best guess, Nathostoma spingarium, most common in Thailand. First human case was a Thai woman in 1889. Humans are not the definitive host 
that that honor be dubious honor belongs to cats, dogs, and other mammals. The embryonated eggs of G. spinigerum will hatch in water, where their larvae larvae will infect a number of intermediate hosts, including fish. My guess is that this patient acquired her nematode through some fish-based dish in the typical Thai diet that we are learning so much about these days on TWIP. However, there is no mention of gastrointestinal distress, which would be expected when the larvae migrate through the intestinal wall into the abdominal cavity. They're too small. As a differential, I would consider any geographically appropriate organism that could be the cause of cutaneous larva migrants. According to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, treatment is usually a 21-day course of albendazole. I cannot thank you enough for putting making a PDF available of the new edition of Parasitic Diseases. It is fantastic reading, and the color plates are wonderful. I'm looking forward to the strange looks I will get when I ask for a hardbound copy for Christmas. I cannot help where my curiosity takes me. The weather in Austin is cloudy, 17C, 64F, with a few signs that sweaters will be appropriate in the near future. Thanks for the good work. Austin is Jared is in Austin, the current home, the new home of Rich Condit. He moved. He moved I'll from be, Gainesville I'll be to doing. Austin. He gave up all wow. that good pizza down in Florida? <laughs> yeah, well, he, he moved to be near his kids. Austin's a great place. He's no longer a professor. He retired. It's a lovely And city. he figured, why stay? What the heck? I hear good things about Austin, so no, I hope Austin's he enjoys very, it very, uh, We're going to go do a twiv there. Habitable. It's very happy. One day. And so you, you may come, Dixon. I, I would enjoy going back to Austin. I've been there before. Daniel. All right, Yosef writes, Dear Twip Troop, I apologize for not writing for the last case. Rotations are hard and time-consuming, and I don't always have the time to do full research on the case and come up with an answer that is somewhat intelligent. <laughs> because of that, I took Dr. Rackenell's advice and looked up migratory facial swelling due to parasites to see if there were any previous cases. Lo and behold, I got back an article about nathostomiasis causing migratory facial swelling in Thai women. I think I'll go with this as my prime diagnosis. Nathostomiasis can be obtained from eating undercooked snakes, frogs, fish, or birds. The nematode found within them lives within the GI tract, but also likes to migrate to subcutaneous tissues throughout the body. If the parasite starts to migrate within the face, then a reaction could lead to the distressing symptoms that our patient presented with. Treatment would be with albendazole, 400 milligrams times 21 days, as reported in the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. <laughs> now, how can we argue with that? Exactly. Other diagnosis that I may be considering uh, is cutaneous larval migraines caused by other parasites like Ancelostoma brasiliensis. I would ask if the patient sleeps on the ground or for any reason had her face near the floor for prolonged periods of time recently. I would assume that this wouldn't present as facial swelling as much as serpiginous lesions, there but I have yet to see either, so I cannot judge. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff. Right. So thanks for writing, Yosef. And I know at some point we were going to ask him to help us with our distribution efforts, right? To get him Absolutely. to help us distribute our book to all the medical students in the United States and eventually throughout the world. So that is our goal. That's, that the, is our goal. The PDF, right? <coughs> so the, the hardcover too. <clears throat> actually, the PDF initially, but we also want to actually get the hardcovers out there too. Okay. So not just Joseph, but say any of our listeners want to help us with that. I think the PDF will spread virally by the internet, but I don't think the book can spread this way when it's a hardcover. Won't it spread parasitically? I would love virally? it. I would love it to spread <laughs> parasitically. <laughs> and so Luke writes, Greetings. I am a longtime listener of TWIM and TWIV, and have recently ventured into TWIP. I would like to take a swing at this case. My guess would be Nathostomiasis by G. Spinigerum. The reasoning would be based on the migratory facial edema and eosinophilia. A differential to consider would be trichinolosis, due to the loose stool a few weeks back. Hmm. I would confirm the diagnosis with an assay and do a CT to check for hemorrhage. I would begin treatment with corticosteroids to control inflammation and then begin treating with albendazole or ivermectin. Thank you. And, yeah, how do you, you see? I don't have this version of your uh, iPod pad. It's a Macintosh. It's a Macintosh it's computer. Not an iPod or an iPod. See how there's like pad, a keyboard pad, pad, pad. and the screen. It's a little different. This uh, later a, on, we'll give you a tutorial. This thing here <laughs> is called a trackpad, and you, yeah, yeah, using yeah. two fingers, you can scroll up and down. You see, I don't it's have like that pushing, option on any like device that I own. It's like pushing the paper up. So that's new to me. Wait, you don't have two fingers? I do, but I don't have the, the option. No, I don't have an iPod. A, a pad scrolling device on Thou art a Luddite. A Luddite. I am a Luddite. 
Bill writes, Twip Crew, greetings from Western New York. Vincent sounded dejected at the lack of response to last week's case. Truth be told, I think he was missing Dixon and was perhaps a bit emotional. I would totally agree with that. (laughs) Uh, Need not worry. You have many attentive listeners. All the same, I figured it was time to take another shot. I am one for one. The case of the woman from Thailand with swelling on the face that is moving around, nathostomiasis, and he relates the CDC description which I think we've heard enough of already, so we don't have to repeat it, right? True. Agreed? I think that's true. And then treat Did with it. albendazole or ivermectin. Many thanks, Bill. And our last one. Our last one, Shelby writes. Shelby David Laurie. I'm writing in to, to briefly guess that the woman is experiencing nathostomiasis. I have just downloaded the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases and intend to read it. I really enjoy all the twees. Keep up the good work. Look at that. We lamented. We did. And they answered. Yep. What great listeners we have. We do. We have a Plus, responsive audience. Your book is getting distributed. How about that? This is from Dixon from the days when he didn't believe in podcasts. I, when were those? No, we don't need to argue. <laughs> Daniel, everyone guessed nanthostomiasis, but that's probably not right, is it? <laughs> right, it's too bad it was it a red is. herring. <laughs> I, now, now I feel really bad. No, you, no. If you hadn't eaten that red herring, you would have gotten another. Then they wouldn't have gotten this nathostomiasis. I don't exactly. think you feel badly. No, no. I'm actually glad that everybody got this right. And that was the hope, right? We want to, you know, we, we don't want to make them. I mean, I have to admit, that last one, as I, as I mentioned, was even presented. It took me a while afterwards to actually uh, acknowledge. Um, because, you know, it was a few years ago. It hadn't really been well described. It True. was this cluster. True. It was, at that point, I felt circumstantial. But as more and more cases were described, I, yeah. you know, I, I wanted That was to- a great uh, vignette of the history of the discovery of nathosomiasis also. Well, I have to say, that's the great thing. is As we read through these emails, they present everything, I think, that we used to have to present. Exactly. They, the life cycle's been gone through, treatment options. There you go. I will mention, I'll mention a couple things. A few of our listeners suggested the concept of treating someone in the tropics with steroids and uh just yeah everyone everyone can shrug a little and you know why why would that be a problem and i think we've brought that up is that there's so many things in the tropics and particular i think of strongaloides is you don't want to cause one problem while treating another right um so i'm going to jump right to well right past diagnosis or i'm going to just briefly stop at diagnosis (laughs) and because it was mentioned by some of our um our listeners. And that was that in this part of the world, um, serology is often employed to, to diagnose nathostomiasis. And uh, it's not available in the U.S. It's not really an endemic disease here. So the CDC can't help you out. But if you're in an endemic area like this woman was, and Mahidal University is where she was seen, um, the serology is done, it's positive, and then she's treated. Now, people did ask the question about treatment. Yeah. Um, and if you read a lot of... Um, references and i was recently doing a review exam they say what is the treatment of choice for nathostomiasis and some of the older texts still say surgery the surgical removal text. so can you imagine <laughs> taking this young thai woman and making an incision of her face and trying to remove this worm i mean this mm-hmm. and we now know that um albendazole um taken once a day for three weeks which is very affordable in thailand is is quite effective and this usually is one worm in the face um that's Dixon, do you have any comments? No, I don't. I'm not as familiar gonna, with this I'm as say I should yes. be, but yeah. I think that the answer is yes. Yeah, I'm going to say yes. It, you know, if you think about it, it, it could it be a lot of other places too, though. Yeah, the the worm gets in and it's lost. It doesn't have the right cues, so it's wandering aimlessly. So it doesn't, you know, what we talk about when what was this? How do the schistosomes find each other in the tall grass, or is that the elephants delightfully or something? Delightful. That's right, delightful. delightful. Right. But no, the, this is a lost worm. It's a it's lost an worm. aberrant. Um, it's a stranger in a strange worm. land. That's the way Harold it's Brown used to say it. It's a stranger in a strange yeah. land. I like the lost worm. The, the lost, lost worm. <laughs> you know, have you heard of the lost world? The lost world. By absolutely. By H. G. Wells. Did he write that? I think so. So then, you know, so previously there was surgical uh, excision, uh, uh, but not so exciting on the face. So this woman got albendazole, um, and it's four hundred milligrams twice a day for twenty-one days. Yeah, um, and then what happens? And actually, she got better. The then worm, the worm dies. The worm and dies goes and, down, and it just gets calcified. 
Um, I don't know if it actually gets calcified, right? I mean, I, I guess you could follow up by doing a plain film X-ray to see. Because when they die, um, they calcify. But from That's, there, yeah. From, when from they there, die, they calcify. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was these rhyming. Uh, yes. Carlets are they stay with you for the rest of your life when you hear them for the first time. Yep. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. When they die they calcify. When they die they yeah. calcify. What about the nana? What was that one? Oh, that was the dwarf the dwarf tapeworm. That's why you can remember it has these little uh polar bear bodies. <laughs> that's right. Polar bear you get your bodies. you get your <laughs> you get teddy your bear. Pol- your polar teddy bear from your nana. Nana. That's right. <laughs> it was a little way to remember that. Um but no, so this is as, um, yeah. you know, we're talking about worldwide distribution. Mm-hmm. This is a big thing in Asia, so say it India, is. China, and then just come south. But I don't really think it's been described much in Australia, so we'll say that. Um, but also in Western South America, in Peru, in Ecuador, mm-hmm. and it's Mexico. and Mexico. And if you talk to the Peruvians, it's really not in Peru. It gets brought in from their friendly oh, but neighbors. Of, but of course. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's actually true, but I'll just say yeah, that. Right. That, I do remember an told. outbreak when sushi first became popular in the Western world. Uh, and there was a lot of experimentation, of course, and mm-hmm. a lot of um, failures. And one of the uh, biggest failures was the fact that, that it was never mentioned that you should make sushi with saltwater fish, not freshwater fish. So in uh, northern Mexico, there was a resort that specialized in a special kind of sushi, and they were using the fish that they caught in the lake right next door to where the resort yep. was. And a lot of people did come down with nasus as a mm-hmm. result. So that's, that's, a, that's a pearl for our listeners. This is a, a freshwater learned, fish. A lesson um, learned. Parasite. That's right. that's right. A pearl for our listeners. Uh, yes. Pearls are f- saltwater mostly, but there are freshwater pearls also. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. are. Freshwater. Okay. Did you ever see an imported case, by the way? All right. No, I haven't seen them here at Columbia. I've only seen them when I've gone overseas. You would have to come. The timing would have to. The timing would have to be right. You'd have to go get exposed, and you have to come while it's still migrating. You know, because you're talking about this week of. One of the guesses mentioned trichinellosis as a possibility, and I just wanted to comment Mm -hmm. briefly in saying that the worm trichinella is so small compared to the size of the worm from Nathostomiasis that you wouldn't see. You wouldn't get this kind of a swelling associated with it and it, besides it locates to the muscle so in both cases you wouldn't really have a problem with that so you treated this young lady and she was fine she did she did great how soon after initiation of treatment did the facial swelling subside it actually was several days before she started to have the swelling go down um, a lot of times, this is a challenge. It'd be cellulitis, a lot of things. Initially, you're killing the worm, and you can see the inflammation right. increase. It gets a little worse for, we'll say, 48 hours, and then they get better. So worse, you know, yeah. worsening before Got it, it gets better. Yep. All right. This episode is sponsored by Dixon. Look at him. Look at him. That's Drobo. Okay. No, they're done. We're finished with Drobo. <laughs> Curiosity Stream. Okay, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream. <laughs> All right. They are the world's first ad free nonfiction streaming service with over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content, founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. Okay. So you are guaranteed to get real science shows. They have a wide variety of science and technology content, which you can see on the web or on your phone right. or on your device like your Roku or Apple TV, 196 countries. And what do they have? Science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures, but it's all reality. It's not fiction. They don't make it up. They don't make it up. No, it's <laughs> real stuff. Their library includes Stephen Hawking's favorite places. This is a series oh. where he gets into a CGI spaceship. All right. Do you know what a CGI spaceship yeah, would be? A, it's a generated image. Yeah, it's a generated. He's just sitting there generated. and they generate it. Yeah, and he makes like he's flying to his favorite places in the universe. Dixon, what's your favorite place in the universe? Oh, if I had to go to one place to, yeah. to really be there and to look. Oh, man. I mean... I hate to limit myself to the solar system that Mm. we've got, but I want a closer look at Jupiter. And I'm looking at this Juno (laughs) 
mission and I'm looking for better pictures of the clouds and everything. And, and then they haven't shown too much in no, terms of their gallery pictures. yet. No, yeah. they haven't done it. And I would love to sit Jupiter, on huh? Io amidst all of the sulfur volcanoes mm-hmm. and stare down at the planet Jupiter. I think you ought to go. I would love to. <laughs> like they did in 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's exactly where they were located. Oh, right yeah. between uh, Io and, and right? Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. Daniel, what, what would your favorite destination in the universe? I, I was be? listening to this and I felt like I'm very provincial right now. I, I, have really, I haven't actually traveled much through the solar system other than here on planet Earth. Right, right. So, I, you know, I, my favorite places are actually all, all this planet at the current. But hopefully in the future, I'll get a chance to have favorites like Dixon that are well, extraterrestrial know, favorites. I'll put you in touch with Elon Musk. He wants to go to Mars. <laughs> okay. My favorite place would be the Italian restaurant across Broadway. <laughs> I'd love to go right now. I'm hungry. Ah. Digits, a three-part series hosted by Derek Mueller, creator of the YouTube science channel Veritasium. You know what that means? It sounds like it means truth, truth, right? I would think truth. Explores online safety and security, featuring never-before-seen interviews with Edward Snowden. Oh, my God. And Vint Cerf. You know who Vint Cerf is? Uh, Son of Bennett Cerf? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) A co-founder of the Internet's. Really? Really? Underwater Wonders of the National Parks that takes you underneath the bodies of water on this 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Nice. Lots and lots of other stuff. Good stuff. You would yep. like it. Yep. And here's the thing. You can get a two-month trial for free. How about that? So check it out. Just like the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. For free. free. <laughs> that's free forever. That's right. Not you, just for two months. If your device breaks, you've had it, but that's the only way you can lose it. They also have a high-definition, super high-definition Library 4K nice. over 50 hours. Monthly and annual plans available starting at $2.99 a month, something even Dixon could afford. I don't even have to think twice. You could just whip out that credit card and sign up. I can do it. It's less than a cup of coffee. Yes. I know every morning you buy a cup of coffee. I do that. And it's probably three ninety nine, right? It's a little bit less than that. And actually. Starbucks is pretty expensive. No, no, I don't. By Starbucks. It's probably. bitter, isn't it? Yeah, I don't like it. It's burned. It is burned. I don't like it. And it's a lot French of people roast. are going to write. It's French roast. No, that's okay. They can write. You can get it's light fine. roast. Do you like Starbucks, Daniel? I do. I there do. There you go. I like Pete's. Pete's is very good. Yeah. They have stores in Washington, you know. They do. I, I passed one the other day. I didn't realize they that. They do. Because I like buying their didn't coffee. Didn't they both the start at the same place, though, in Seattle? Uh, I don't know. I think they did. I don't know. Well, check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 completely days. Free. That's two entire months Remarkable. free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We, we thank Curiosity Stream for their support. We do. Of TWIP. We thank them several times. You're fired. I, I beg your pardon. Who am I imitating? <laughs> oh, don't even go there, please. <laughs> please. It was bad enough last night. <laughs> All right. We have a paper. We do. Which Daniel selected. He did. From PLOS Pathogens. It's called TH17 cells are more protective than TH1 cells against the intracellular parasite Trypanosoma cruzi. Right. Otherwise known as American trypanosomiasis. American, because the yes. other one is Trypanosoma brucei. Yeah, Gambians and, vectored, and Rhodesians. They're vectored by different insects. They are. African and they're on sleeping sickness. African sleeping sickness. Yes. And American sleeping sickness. No, no American doesn't, what? Doesn't cause. Doesn't sleep cause sleeping sickness. It's not just tri- just trypanosomiasis. Just trypanosomiasis. So what mutation makes it different? <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, they probably were connected at one time during the Jurassic. And then as the continents split, that's when they sort of diverged. They, they, they diverged. You know, this one in, in the so we're diverging right is now, spread by the Reduvido. Reduvido. Which I like to say. Triatomi. Now, what, Daniel, what, what is this TH1, TH17? How many of them are there? How many actually? are there? Right. See, 17 is, it, it implies that there are 16 others, right? Uh, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But it, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And, uh, you know, actually, maybe uh, Vincent, you'll end up. There, there's a great review on the uh, the lineage of the the t- CD4 positive T cells, and a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with. We've talked about TH1, TH2, yeah. uh, but what happened over time is they started defining 
these helper T cells, these T cells that are directing the immune response by their signature cytokines. Okay. Now, Th1 and Th2 came before this, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. um, in this wonderful article um, by John J. O'Shea and William E. Paul that came out in Science back in February of 2010, which perhaps we'll put a link on our show to, um, they actually talk about how the Th1, um, its signature cytokine is interferon gamma. The Th2, its uh, signature cytokine, cytokines, I'll say, is IL-4 and IL-13. Mm-hmm. It's people are starting to, these are starting right. to get people maybe to remember. But now TH17 is a signature cytokine IL-17. There you, go. Um, you know, then you also have the T regulatory, which um, they have the IL- <clears throat> IL-10 is one of their signature cytokines. And so what you start moving away from just the one and the two, and it's not like we got up to 17, we started changing and calling them by their signature cytokines. So the major, say, T regulatory populations or subsets are your TH1, right. TH2, mm-hmm. they still exist, still recognized, yeah, sure, sure. but now there's a TH17, there's a T regulatory, there's a T follicular helper. And in addition to signature cytokines, as we're gonna discuss in our paper, there are sign- signature um, transcription factors, right? And we're gonna need to know those because they're really at the crux. So our TH1, interferon gamma, has TBET as its signature don't transcription be, factor. Don't be a betting man. Don't. Not me. TH2, as we mentioned, IL-4, IL-13, that's GATA3. And TH17, and this is, you'll want this paper in front of you, maybe I when know. you read this. Are you taking it's notes, a, dude? Is, Are you is, taking notes? It's all in here. Yeah. TH17, <laughs> that's going to be our ROR gamma T is our signature oh. transcription factor. And our T regs, and this, a lot of immunologists will, will not have Fox P3. Right. Um, they actually sometimes refer to them as the Fox P3 positive T regulatory IL-10 secreting um, cells. And so world. that gives us this world. And so we used to have a very primitive, I'll say primitive understanding. As we learn more, it gets more sophisticated. And we used to say like intracellular pathogens, tuberculosis, viruses, that's TH1. Right, right. Extracellular, bigger things bacteria, parasites, that's going to be TH2. And then in leprosy or tuberculosis, we see that if you get a good TH1, you control your tuberculosis and leprosy. If you shift to a TH2 and don't effectively target these intracellular microbes, you get all these bacilli, they're all, their intracellular bacilli, poorly controlled. So we're going to see here a study of which type of CD4 cells are going to control this Parasite and, and what, what kind of a parasite is this? Intracellular, extracellular? Little of each. <laughs> exactly. What's that? It's a little of each. Really? It's really. It's not an obligate intracellular parasite? No, it's not. It can grow extracellularly? It does. Of course it does. So the. Uh, the um, How does it get the, from cell to cell? I don't care. <laughs> but I'd like to tell How you. How does it get from <laughs> cell to cell? No, and that's actually the classic when you see the peripheral smear. <laughs> that's right. You know, and, and you want to just, you want to, how do you tell these trypanosomes that are swimming around yeah, in the blood yeah. from those African trypanosomes? And it's really easy because, you know, this is trypanosoma cruzi or chagas. These, they actually form a nice C when you look at them so you can see what they, what they are. It's a nice mm-hmm. C for so that's chagas. the world's largest canaloplast. I like the C. I can't remember I like this. the C. <laughs> what if it's backwards on the slide, though? Then what is oh, that's, that's true. <laughs> and what, what is a backwards C? I that's right. You have to turn the slide upside down to see that. Yes. So the 17 and the TH17 came from the fact that IL-17 was a signature cytokine. Not that there were 16 previous. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But ILs right. had come up to at least 17. That's why this one was associated. So they called them TH-17. Right. So exactly. let's, let's just briefly review. No. No, no, no. For... No. The African versus the American <laughs> trypanosomes. And oh, please. Just in, a, in a sentence, the African trypanosomes never become intracellular, ever. Okay. They are strictly bloodstream or fluid forms, and they always assume the tripomasticote form, always, mm-hmm. in, the, in the intermediate host, in the definitive host, which is the setsy fly. Then they have sexual stages that are promasticotes and epimasticotes. In American trypanosomiasis... In the bug, in the reduvidi, as you like to say, the pr- parasites go through the same kinds of transformations in the gut tract of the bug 
that the African trypanosomes go through in the tsetse flies. Mm-hmm. Okay, epimastigotes, metacyclic trypanomastigotes, all these uh, goats. When they infect a host, however, then that's where they differ. The tripomastigote stage of T. cruzi penetrates the cytoplasm of a cell. It gets into the naked cytoplasm, drops its flagellum, rounds up, and becomes what looks like leishmania or an amastigote. And that's where it replicates. It divides like crazy and kills the cell. In order to get to another cell, it ruptures the cell it's in. Sounds like a virus a little bit. Out go the amastigotes. They transform again into the tripomastigote stage. They swim in the bloodstream. They get to another tissue. They penetrate a cell, and they infect those cells, too. They have a predilection for cardiac tissue, for nervous tissue, and they cause great damage in both of those places. And uh, the host suffers a long-term sequelae of the infection, sometimes 30 to 40 years worth of suffering, whereas the African trypanosomes replicate faster, they bring the host down quicker, and there's uh, less suffering compared to the American trypanosomes. So those are, that's in brief, that's what the biology is like. So, so this immune system that we'll be discussing today either takes care of the intracellular form in the tissue or the bloodstream form in the blood so what is it going to be, Dr. Griffin? What do you think? Well, you know, I read the article, and I don't want to give away the story, but I, I find it fascinating. Good. It's intracellular. So we did not give it away. <laughs> it's all red. Yeah. Well, we're going to get there very soon. <laughs> these, these are uh, studies done largely in vitro, in cells, or- A lot of them are. In mice. That's right. right. And mice uniformly die from this if they're not treated. They have a, a very important reagent. They do. It is a T cell receptor transgenic mouse. Yes, 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 yes. The T cell receptors are very important on the surface of cells to recognize antigen. There you go. And they have a specific T cell receptor, which they've put in these mice, a CD4 T cell receptor that's specific for a T. cruzi epitope. Indeed. Correct. Okay, and they're going to use this throughout. Yes. And the reason they're important is because they can make parasite-specific Th1 and Th17 cells in vitro. Right. right. Okay? So they, and this is what they're trying to do, figure out what's important, as you guys said earlier. Well, there was a rumor that, T, that IL-17 had some immune effect on the parasite, yeah. whereas in earlier days, that was not the case. That Th1 responses were thought to be the dominant responses, but in this case, they've resurrected an old finding and, and really done some great modern biology. Right. All right, so the first experiment, they take Th1 or Th17, which are specific for this epitope they make from these mice. They transfer them into RAG knockout mice along with CD8 cells, and then they challenge them. So this is a mouse experiment. Yep. And they show that the cells go in, and they show that the RAG knockouts without any adoptively transferred cells die so we should probably mention what these rag knockout animals are. So they're okay. animals with no mature B or T cells. Not so the only mature B and T cells these mice will have are the ones we add. From another mouse, which we call adoptive transfer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Rag stands for? Recombination activating gene. Thank you. It is deleted in these animals. And as a consequence, you get no rearrangement exactly and no production of B or T cells. It's just a fabulous, this, this gene discovered in the laboratory of David Baltimore. Really? Yes. Wow. Very, very important discovery. So you can make these mice that have no B or T cells. They're great reagents. Then you can add whatever you want and ask, cool. are these important? So if you just give T. cruzi to these rag knockouts, boom, dead. Okay, but if you give them <laughs> only CD8 cells, they die also. That doesn't confer any protection. But if you co-transfer Th1 and CD8, uh, they improve. They they lo- live longer. They don't live forever. But if you give them Th17 and CD8, uh, then they live forever. They live <laughs> forever. <laughs> For a mouse, that's about two years. <laughs> or whatever a mouse lives. Out to so, 100 days, they're still alive. So C- Th1 and CD8, you got to have them both. Do a little bit, but TH17 and CD8s do mm-hmm. even more. Yeah. So I, I... Is that clear, Dixon? It is very clear. I want to make sure... No, it's clear. It's clear. <laughs> um, 
were these mice that lived for 100 days, were they sterilized by their immunity, or do they carry the parasite but at low levels so they don't cause pathology? The ones that survive forever? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 100% it, survival is it rate? sterilizing immunity? Yeah, I meant to ask that that way. That was the question. Parasites per mil. Yeah, I mean, they do these parasite counts at 19 days out, right? No. And they, yeah. they still have some. So we're not seeing um, sterilized immunity at day 19. Um, but they don't fi- I don't see that they follow it out longer. So I, I don't know if they have sterilizing yeah. immunity. Yeah. And that's actually one of the interesting features, right? I mean, this, like, why do we ask this question? Is that, oh, unfortunately, with a lot of, well, a lot of <laughs> infections like T. cruzi, a person will get an initial infection and they'll control it. But it's not sterilizing that's control. Right. It's it's a control of a small number, which maybe later on can cause problems. So in their introduction, they said that there are 300,000 people living within the United States that harbor T. cruzi also. Now, those people are not readily identifiable just by looking, and they're probably not feeling very ill from this as well. So they have a controlling immunity, but those people may not even know they're infected. And so what, what a common way of transferring the infection in the United States is by transfusion. And that's why I was asking about the sterile immunity, because if there's not sterile immunity. I would, then, I would tend to say a potential, but we actually monitor the blood source so that we don't right, see that. Uh, right. So that's a risk that we're keeping, hopefully, from happening in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. Blood transfusion. Don't they check the blood supply for it? No, in the U.S.? No, they do, do. They do now. They, they didn't do. used to, and it uh, became enough of a problem. And so the interesting, I think I talked about this about a year or so ago on one of our episodes, is I would get a lot of referrals to... I went to give blood I'm from El Salvador <laughs> and they say, I have to come and talk to you right. and it would be a positive screening test. They were rejected from blood donation. How interesting. Um, so that's ho- hopefully we're doing a good job of preventing that transmission. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now in, in kind of a follow up, they actually purify the TH17 cells, you know, with the cell purification. Not the homogeneity, but close. close just to make sure there's not some contaminant in yeah, there yeah, yeah. that's conferring this protection and that, still protects them. Right. So yeah. that's TH17s doing right. it. Remember, this is in mice. And then they say, what if these TH17s are simply becoming TH1s after you stick Well, them? that's right. That's, that's I think, exactly. and I think that that's a great thing to bring up. And the reason I put this article sort of out there is initially when these were described, it was as if it was etched in stone. This is TH17. Mm-hmm. And then it became clear there's a plasticity. There even are cells that are making gamma interferon, and IL-17. So what do you call those? Right. So there's a plasticity back and forth. And and now they're going to go you know, after that by looking at um, transcription factor yeah. knockout. Yeah. Huh. So they uh, they purify these cells from a mouse lacking TBET, the TBET gene. So they can't make TH1s anymore. Clever. So the TH17 can never become a TH1 because it doesn't have the right transcription factor. There you go. As Daniel said earlier, certain transcription factors are needed for the different programs. Yeah. So they take these TH17s and they still protect. So you don't need any TH1 cells for protection in mice. You don't need any CD4 cells either because they're not giving them right. CD4 mm-hmm. cells, right? Yeah. CD4. Um, I guess I would say that TH17 are a type of CD4 cell. But not an interferon gamma Positive CD, no, true, which that's would be right. a TH1. With TH1, yeah, that's, what, that's what they so. say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're in the weeds, Dixon. We are. Just, just. <laughs> do you know like, that? Do you know that saying? I do. <laughs> it's the same as going south. <laughs> so now the question is, how does this work? What do these TH17 cells do? Right. Are they making something? Are they Inducing doing something? Are they helping something? Who else knows? Do There's something? so many possibilities. Right. There right? are many. So. They now go to um, cells and culture. They get macrophages, peritoneal macrophages, yep. and they can infect these um, and get good replication of the parasites in them. They can. And they, they're not destroyed by the macrophages, are they? No, they're not. Are they resistant? Apparently. Uh, it's cool, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the parasite is not in a parasitophorous vacuole. That's the beauty of T. cruzi. It crawls into the naked cytoplasm and then transforms, and so it's treated like a cell organelle. It, it's not part of the uh, phagocytic pathway, and that's, that's a problem with this organism, and that's why this paper is so important. So they take these infected macrophages, they add either TH1 cells or interferon gamma, yes. which is made by mm. TH1 cells, right. and this reduces the number of cells that become infected. So these things have an effect 
on infection by T. cruzi. They use an antibody against interferon gamma. It reverses the protective effects. Okay, so interferon gamma seems to be involved, which is a soluble mediator. Adding Th17 cells also reduces the number of infected macrophages. So both Th1 and 17, which we already know from previous experiments, can protect in vitro infection of macrophages. So nature loves a backup. Nature loves a backup, just like on Drobo. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a great lead-in. <laughs> but I don't have a Drobo ad. <laughs> too bad. Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> now, this protective effect of of uh, TH17 cells, you can duplicate by simply adding IL-17. There you go. The product of it. The eponymous cytokine. Yep. Is that the right way to say it? The um, eponymous cytokine? I think so. I think that works. It's after which the cells are named, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And if you, of course, add an antibody to IL-17... What do you think happens? It doesn't protect. No more protection. So uh, this looks is pretty, pretty neat. good. Looks so pretty good. IL seventeen alone right. somehow is blocking infection of these. Somehow. Ah, that's the question, right? You have to figure that out. So how does this all work? Well, Th one cells are known to produce nitric oxide by an enzyme called INOS, inducible nitric oxide synthase. Right. Yes. But Th17 cells don't doesn't make, do that. they don't make INOS, do right? So it must be something else to be somewhere. other than nitric oxide, nitric oxide. Right. Um, so they think, well, maybe reactive oxygen species, yeah. the so-called ROS. Or superoxide. Yes. Yeah, these are uh, radicals that destroy things, including these uh, parasites, right? That's right. They would destroy them. Right. And um, Would they destroy ISIS? ISIS? <laughs> Those are radicals. Is that a joke? I think that was a joke. That was an attempt at a joke. Yes. I don't think Alan Dove would be impressed. No, nah, he wouldn't. No, nah, that's way below his standard. <laughs> so they t- they use macrophages that are from a genetically modified mice that have been disrupted for the a subunit of the NADPH oxidase. Which, you know, when I read that remember? acronym that went all the way across in letters, it almost filled up an entire sentence. You know what NADPH <laughs> but is. of course I That's do. from the old... Yeah, no. Biochemistry listen. text. Tell me all well, about it. Well, this enzyme is what's important for making these reactive that oxygen sense. species. Correct. And so um, this this deletion has no effect on nitric oxide no. generation. No. So they infect these knockout macrophages with their parasites. And what do you think happens? They get killed. They get killed. They don't get protected by what? By whatever NAD does. Well, these are um, IL... IL the bone marrow macrophages, they're not protected by IL-17. Thank you, if they're lacking the NADPH gene. Yes, that's so the, right. the implication that's is right. IL-17 is somehow inducing reactive oxygen species uh, via NADPH oxidase. Right, Daniel? Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I on the right weed track here? I think so. Yes. Sometimes you get lost in the weeds. You're on the it's short. It's easy to you're, get you're, lost you're, in the weeds. You're shaking yourself off like a dog that just dove in the water, and you're fine. Okay, so again, that's a macrophage cell. So now let's look in mice. You always want to see in an animal what's going on, right? Absolutely. So they want to know if IL-17A can protect mice in vivo. So what do they do? They can add antibodies to IL-17 mice and infect them. No effect effect. on parasitemia levels. It still protects. Hmm. Overproduction of IL-17 in mice. No effect on parasitemia. Mm-hmm. This is weird because we th- in vitro it was protective, was. right? Mm-hmm. And before we showed that Th17 cells were protective, we assumed that it was via IL-17, but IL-17 alone is not enough to replace the protective effect of Th17 cells, right? Apparently. So what would you say? This is what the immunologists do. The protection must be through an IL-17 independent. Independent. So we're there. We already (laughs) answered the question. (laughs) IL-17 independent. It's. I, I think it's funny how that always so it opens IL, up the entire. IL seventeen has an indirect effect, not a direct effect. It induces something that then affects the parasite. Well, here they show that you don't even need IL seventeen. Well, as long as you get the other thing to work. Or maybe IL seventeen identifies the cell, but that's not what is doing the job. That well, that's and I think that's where we are. So they wanted to figure out what was gone here. So they they go back into mice and they look at protection conferred by 
giving the mice TH17 cells alone or together with CD8 positive T cells. And uh, it's already okay. been known that there is some role of, for CD8 cells in protection, even though this paper is focusing on CD4 Four. cells. Mm-hmm. CD8s are important. Um, uh, and basically, uh, CD8 cells can protect, but they're even better when TH17 cells are, are part of the mix. Uh-huh. And, and TH17 cells help CD8 cells to proliferate, reproduce, oh. divide, undergo it's a mitosis. Mitogenic factor, perhaps. So somehow TH17s are interacting with CD8s to make the clearance better. Make sense, Dixon? Well, um, in the logical network of immunology as we know it today, yes. So C- C- TH17 cells are important, but TH IL-17 doesn't seem to be mediating protection. CD8 cells are together with TH17 cells. Right, so we maybe have... another product from the IL. Okay, that's it. Let's look for another product. Um, now, what would that other product be? Well, something that might induce NAD, NADH. Oxidized. By co-culturing suboptimally stimulated T cells with individual cytokines. Individual purified cytokines made by TH17 cells? Mm-hmm. I don't know how many that would be. <laughs> they found that IL-21 20. recapitulates the help. 21. So it's not 17. cell needs to be renamed. It's 21. <laughs> well, I, th- I think that's the challenge is we think of it as only making IL-17, but it yeah. makes a number of cytokines. That's, the, again, I'll say the signature cytokine, but it also makes IL-21, and it makes different IL-17 A through F. Complicated. Makes IL so, uh, two. These uh, experiments that I'm talking about were done in vitro. Um, so um, they continue with that. They show that cells knocked out for IL twenty one receptor. They can't be activated by these TH seventeen cells. These are CD eight cells knocked out. So mm-hmm. again, that shows that signaling is going on. Uh, and then they do it in mice. Um, they challenge, they give mice either wild type or IL-21 receptor knockout CD8 cells uh, together with TH17 cells, infect them with T. cruzi. Guess what? Without the IL-21 receptor, there's no protection. So TH17 somehow um, making IL-21 that's binding the receptor that's leading to protection on CD8 cells. Yeah. Are you okay with that, Dixon? So far, so good. TH17 mediated protection operates through secretion of IL-21 and the resulting indirect T helper effects on CD8 cells. So you have the receptor for that. I think there's one more experiment. There is, actually. Do you remember it, Dixon? I has to go back to the CD4 cells because I did read this paper and the last thing was about <laughs> CD4 cells. <laughs> Mechanisms responsible yeah. for the effect on TH17 cells on on CD8 cells. They get greater expansion of CD8 cells in the presence of TH17, uh, and that's probably part of it. Higher levels of TBET. Oh. Remind us, Daniel, what is TBET doing? Making So TBET is our TH1 signature TH1. transcription factor. Okay. But we said already that... Um, TH1 is not so good. Well, it's not TH17 I mean, becoming it TH1s. We know that TH1s will work, but of, it's not because of course. TH17. Yeah. And it's really, it's about which is more important, not saying that one isn't important. So TH1 is important, but the TH17 effect through IL-21 is most important. Yeah, TH17s have a so greater a hierarchy of, a greater mm-hmm. TH, uh, IL-21 effect than TH1 cells. And, and you we're, can, you know, where we're going is we're trying to figure out how do we create a vaccine or some yeah, yeah. immune modulation to help these people. And you can imagine in an infected human that all of these immune system arms of, of defense are brought to bear on the parasite. So mm-hmm. to say which one is playing a dominant role, we'd probably know which stage of the infection the patient is at to begin with, and then you can make a decision. Right. You know, that's an interesting issue because what where they're going with this is we know the target. <laughs> now they're going to say now we want to sculpt the right effective immune response. Like we sculpt, saw, like, that's a wonderful way to put that <laughs> you're going to create a statue in honor of <laughs> immunity and it's going to be complicated and, and filled with exactly uh, so when they have a vaccine we now yeah, know that different right. adjuvants that's different right. things that's right. That's right. will give you a nice let's say th17 yes. versus a th1 yes. or a th2 yes. 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 and here they're going to argue we want to vaccinate a vaccination strategy that creates a robust th17 response in fact right. that's the uh, they, let's go to that experiment. Okay, it's sure. really interesting. So, 
can we skew the response to TH17 cells? Because they say in a natural infection, TH17s are not the predominant response. Mm-hmm. But here we've shown in this paper that they're really good for protecting mice. So, so can, how can we make them better? Right? Exactly. How can we make them better? How can we induce them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, um, they do an interesting experiment. They vaccinate mice with a recombinant protein from T. cruzi, and they include an, an agonist of a toll-like receptor mm-hmm. that will induce innate responses, cytokines, in, in, including. And they have another chemical, which they call an adjuvant. It's PAM3CSK4, which skews the CD4 TH response to, to TH17. So this is previously known. So that's mm-hmm. where the CD4s right? come back in. And that's they right. can skew the response to this yeah. antigen yeah. by using... <laughs> this chemical, it's great, isn't it? And it so is. they show, they make T. cruzi reactive TH17 cells, uh, and so they can induce these specifically. I don't think they ever showed that this, these were protective, though. They didn't do that experiment, but we already know that, so I assume that mm-hmm. it would be, right? Mm. So vaccinated mice, you can skew the response to T. cruzi in this way to get TH17 cells. <laughs> And presumably that would be protective, but they don't show that in this paper. That's right. So what do you think of that, Dixon? I think it's great. But if you're going to use this as a human vaccine, yeah. then the toll-like receptors are different. Yeah. Mice and humans have different sets of toll-like receptors. Right? Yeah, sure. So as a result, if you find out that this works in mice by taking advantage of this toll-like receptor, you may not be able to do the same thing with a human yeah, that's right. directed vaccine. All right, so TH17s can give a... Protective response to T. cruzi, yep. right? It depends on uh, some reactive oxygen species. Exactly. They, prov- they provide help to CD8 cells via IL-21. Yep. And you can uh, bias a, a vaccination. You can induce TH17 cells by vaccination, and they call by using TH17 skewing mm-hmm. adjuvants. I like that. So kebabs, um, they're making kebabs out of <laughs> macrophages. <laughs> they th- they talked about this in the context of developing a human Chaga vaccine. Yeah, well, yeah. So I guess um, I don't. Do we assume that Th seventeens would be protective in people? No, we have to look, mm. right? Yeah, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a good foundation. How would, how would you do that? How would you ah, do that experiment? Good. It's actually kind of tough. I mean, you sort of have to look at you know not everyone who gets infected with Chagas will go on to develop problems, um, but a lot, also but a lot, like let's say 25% yeah. will have cardiac or gastrointestinal manifestations. And, and that'll be regional, right? South America versus Central America, more exactly. gastro versus cardiac. Exactly. Um, but there may be ways to look at these patients, look at levels of TH17 versus TH1 response, and then follow them prospectively, or even just do a case control. We say these people have bad outcomes, gastrointestinal or cardiac problems, Let's look at their TH1, TH17 response mm. versus people who, let's say, the 75% that do just fine. You're starting to get more evidence because yeah, eventually they're sure. going to want to try to vaccinate people. Of course. But you, know, you need a little more information. Yeah, you need to, to know if, uh, if yeah. TH17. Now, they say in this paper that TH17s are not the, let's see, where is that, where is that sentence? It's in the vaccine section. See, are not the predominant natural response to T. cruzi infection. But I don't mm-hmm. know. They don't say if that's humans or mice. <laughs> no, that's a problem. And that's always a problem. I, I feel like every sentence in, you know, a mouse research paper <laughs> needs to be, like, clarified in mice. I bet that's in, in mice. Human. Yeah. So, yeah, your, your study in people is important to do. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see some correlation, you could think about doing this. Did you like this paper, Dixon? Loved it. Do you yeah, like, do you like was, immunology? I I love immunology. I don't just like it. I love it. You love it? I do. I do. Most of the work that I did on my own worm, besides the nurse cell work, was on the immune system and its responses and how to detect them and that sort of thing. So I, I've always enjoyed this kind of literature. However, I get bogged down <clears throat> in some of these subsections when the results are being reported, when none of the terms are explained. <laughs> And, 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 yeah, well, they assume you know it. If no, I know paper, that. And right? it's written for a very small audience then because general audiences need to have a little bit better explanations than that, I think. That They're hard to is, read. This is complicated stuff. They're hard to read. Because when you read all these mutations that they've done and, and, the, and the construct that you have, in the end, you, you're starting to wonder whether that mouse can actually live 
with all those mutations in their immune system because they've blocked this, they've blocked that, they've blocked the other. It must require a very specialized um, animal facility to make sure that these animals are not compromised during or after the time that they're uh, subjects. That's, you know, I used to be on the Animal Care Committee here, and it was nothing like what it is today, obviously. So it's you become very, 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 very uh, specialized. All right. We are, we are ready for a case study. Uh, oh, are we still doing that? <laughs> we okay. will never not do that, Daniel. Never not do what that. What if he we, runs out of cases? Here we go. Impossible. Okay, I'm ready. All right. A 48-year-old gentleman from Bamako, Mali. Mali. Can Bamako. I say Mali? Mali. Bamako. M-A-L-I. Bamako. How did you pronounce that? Bamako. Bamako, Mali. What am I, what am I going to do when you can't help me with the yeah, pronunciation? No, I'll always be here for you. Okay. <laughs> Who comes, that is the capital of Mali, by the way. So he comes into the hospital in Washington Heights, New York City. That's here. But of course. <laughs> That's the Columbia Hospital. <laughs> that was a referral. <laughs> with profuse, watery diarrhea. So he shows up uh, in the uh, ER. Profuse. And the story is... He was born in Mali. He came to the United States at age 18. Um, he has been working here in the United States as a long-haul truck driver for 30 years, right? Wow. Um, but frequently returns to Mali to visit. He recently <laughs> went back to Mali to attend really? his father's funeral. He spent three weeks there and returned to the U.S. one week prior to the onset of his symptoms. Right. He's reporting... Vomiting, weakness, no fever, but diarrhea that got so bad that he had to leave his apartment because there was diarrhea everywhere. Oh, no. He's estimating about three liters of diarrhea per day. Oh, my God. Maybe more. Now he's coming in to the Columbia emergency it's, room. You say diarrhea, not dis- I mean, it's, it's, your, it's diarrhea. It's he's not reporting blood. He's just okay. got, he's got lots of. Just checking. Mm-hmm. I'll give you guys a little bit more. Mali. So a week, after, a week, a week after coming back from Mali, right? Mm-hmm. He was there for three weeks. There for three weeks, hanging out with his dad for the funeral. Mm-hmm. Um, no, he wasn't hanging out with, with his dad, but no. it was his dad's funeral. And actually, that's important. He was his hanging father, out at his father. His dad. He, his, and this was actually you can imagine people's sort of hair went up. Um, you know, the father died, and then he goes to attend the funeral. He wasn't there. He wasn't preparing the body. He wasn't, you know, these are like our mm. big red flags. You just came back from a funeral sure, sure, um, sure. in Mali. So he was there, but he was not directly attending to his Got father's uh, body. Got it. Um, no past medical or surgical history. This is a guy who has not seen a doctor in a long time. No allergies. Um, he's the fourth son. And that was actually the social dynamic because the fourth son they're like, no inheritance, nothing for you here. You, you better go out in the world and find your own way, which is why he came to the U.S. Um, as I mentioned, his father just died. <clears throat> it wasn't very clear what his father died from. We asked, but um, his mother's alive, well, doesn't have any problems. She's actually back in Mali. Doesn't take any medications. As I mentioned, he's a long-haul truck driver. He has a single apartment here in um, Washington Heights, sort of northern Manhattan. Um, there is some alcohol and marijuana use. <laughs> Hopefully not when he's driving. Okay. <laughs> Let us hope. Um, it's now legal in many more states. They keep adding, right? I think Massachusetts. What happened yesterday? Colorado. The three more states made it legal. Did they? Um, now, exposure history. I'm going to preempt Vincent here. Um, when we push, <clears throat> it depends who talks to him, but um, at least to some of us, he does report that he... Um, he has exposure to professional sex workers. Right. Good. No, um, not good, but thank you for that. <laughs> you're encouraging this? this no, no, I'm not <laughs> encouraging it. This is very bad. He probably okay. doesn't use condoms, right? Um, no. He is. He actually, he said he doesn't have a fever, but we measure he's got a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius. So that's well over 100. Blood pressure is down about 80 over 40. So this is a low blood pressure, not a healthy guy. Heart rate is up above 110, so he's got a quick heart rate. He's got low blood pressure. He's breathing rapidly in the high 20s. Um, he, he is cachectic. He looks wasted. You can see, you can count his ribs. He's a very thin appearing male mm. in significant distress. He's, he's got the rapid heart rate. He's breathing rapidly. 
He's got a distended and diffusely tender abdomen with increased bowel sounds. He actually has a, a really, I should say, um, upsetting fungating lesion area all around the whole anal area with significant skin breakdown fungal. and strong odor. Did you say um, fungal or just a <clears throat> fungating? Fungating. Fungating. What does that mean? Um, I think you describe it as a um, irregular surface border, lots of maceration, um, lots of skin breakdown. But there's but there's actually a raised, um, almost if you thought of warts or something, like a thick layer all around it. Um, and I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about what that is because I think that, that that gets into an HPV-related malignancy we, we, we later discover. You'd call that hyperkeratosis? More than that, actually. Uh, the okay. exposure to uh, professional sex workers of yes. the same or the opposite sex? Of the opposite sex women. Um, and I'm going to give you a little more. I'm going to tell you that he undergoes HIV testing. Mm-hmm. And maybe for our virologist listening, it turns out his HIV is clade B. So he's positive. Positive for HIV, and it's clade B, which some people out there might be interested in. He's got a very elevated viral load. His T cells are very low, less than 100. Mm. Um, and we're going to send off some stool studies, and they're going to give us the answer for what's going on. So here we have a sort of the nutshell for people. Um, we have an HIV positive gentleman returning from Mali with um, significant diarrhea. Right. And it's a parasite. And it's a parasite. And it's a parasite. And we're going to make the diagnosis from looking it's at the It's in the sixth stool. edition of our book, I bet. Oh, it's definitely in there. Okay. So, uh, where, uh, Clade B is very interesting because it's from a specific place. And it ain't Mali. <laughs> <laughs> I should should I have not said that? You want me to? No, no. Out? Actually, I think that's that's good. This um, and that's why I threw it in. I thought you know you're a virologist that get a little. So you know, we, we, know, have, we have uh, people who listen to the other shows that make it a little cross. Is this the first time we know he's HIV positive? This is the first time we know. So he didn't know this. He didn't know that. So we make the diagnosis in this whole context. So he sells less than a hundred. So he's quite far into the infection. He's had HIV for a yeah while. Yes. Okay. So he's getting some opportunistic infection. Looks like that's that's where we're pushing. Seems like it, yeah. Okay. And it's a parasite, Dixon. And it's a parasite, Dixon. <laughs> and it seems to be messing with his intestines. Sounds that way. It's interesting. Well. Initially, I thought it might be primary HIV infection because sometimes that causes GI disturbances. No, that is true. And it wipes sure. out the, um, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue in, in doing that. But it looks like he's way beyond that because his T-cells are so low. Way beyond. Dixon, all we have to go with is this diarrhea, immunosuppressed person with diarrhea, but that's probably Many enough. possibilities. Many. Many possibilities. <clears throat> and for our people that like to Google, Mali, HIV, <laughs> diarrhea. <laughs> right. I don't know if Mali alone is going to help you. No, it uh, probably won't. Well, the HIV part. Um, and what was it? One of the cases was in the literature when we searched for it. That was your friend... Um, <laughs> Actually, uh, Elaine, Elaine, Elaine yes. hers was in there. Wink, go with your intuition. <laughs> That's right. Feel the That's force. Feel the force, Link. That's a hit. Wink. wink. Sorry, Wink. All right. Just a couple of emails. Uh, one is from Jonathan, who writes, this just came in. I just heard your podcast on our nature paper. Wow. All right. So this is, thanks, guys. Great job. This is Professor Jonathan Weitzman from... Um, the University of Paris. Okay. So I look it up. This is TWIP number 88 from May 2015. Wow. He just found it. <gasps> well. Uh, and I will tell you what paper it was that, uh, here, let me find it. TWIP 88, because the, the link is not working. Trip. Ah, the name of the episode. And I think, yeah, you were here at 88, right, mm-hmm. right there? I was. I was, came on it, I think, episode 80. Yeah. Was... French foreign liege, lesion. Lesions. That was my title. French. Oh, you want some credit? Uh, but you, you don't get enough credit? <laughs> <laughs> of course, they're all your titles. Otherwise, I won't graduate. <laughs> Vincent Dixon and Daniel discuss how a secreted protein from the protozoan parasite Tyleria transforms its host right. cells via a cellular proto-oncogene. So here's a interesting example of a transforming. Um, yep. Remember? Uh, let me see if I can find it. 
Transformation by a prolyl <laughs> isomerase was a nature paper. The Illyria parasites secrete a prolyl isomerase to maintain host leukocyte transformation. They make the leukocytes divide because it's yes. a better place for them to replicate. Do you remember this now? Is it coming back, Dixon? I know all about Tylyria. I knew someone who worked on it, actually. So he found it yep. randomly and thanks us. Okay, that's yep. cool. Good. Um, Garen writes, just a quick comment that may be of timely interest. This is for you and me, Daniel. Mm-hmm. First, the weather from Lebanon, Oregon. I'm trying to make Lebanon popular. I really do live here as well. The weather is rain. Now, <laughs> now the comment, our friend Marcus over at Omega Tau Podcast just did an entire episode on flying the V22 Osprey, episode mm. 219. Oh came out just over one week ago. It's all about the engineering and flying of the V22. I even That's saw one fly flight. over Lebanon this summer. Cheers. So we saw one. Yeah, we saw by. one going by. We so were. we said, what's that? And I said, oh, There's a awesome. long history of accidents with that airplane. No, that's very difficult to uh, pilot. Is it? Yeah. The Osprey uh, has had a lot of crashes. And the last email is from Katreya. Does it Katreya. ring a bell, Dixon? Does it ring a bell? Katreya? Um, Katreya. No. Does the name Quasimodo ring a bell? <laughs> she said next to you. Yeah. She sat next to you for TWIV <laughs> it's bad. a few weeks ago. She was our visitor okay. from Cleveland Clinic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Hi, okay. TWIV team. I yeah, thought okay. you guys might find this interesting. It's a new device that can quickly detect malaria in one minute using a combination of magnets and lasers. Case Western Reserve team has patented this thing, and uh, it is a 20 times faster than needed to secure results with traditional te- methods. It's $1 per test. It is a portable battery-operated magneto-optical detector. It uses magnets and lasers. What do you think of that, Dixon? Is that useful? Absolutely. You bet. It can save $1.2 billion on annual diagnostic costs. Wow. Very, very easy to do. I'm wondering what it uses. You think it uses some blood? Well, they're, they're talking about the hemozoan having yes. magnetic properties. That's right. And that's, that's what right. they're using. Here we go. It looks for a specific type of iron within a single drop of blood, hemozoan. It's released by parasites because it has magnetic properties. When the device's magnets get close, the once randomly oriented hemozoan crystals are aligned. Less laser light can pass through the more closely aligned crystals, giving these, those conducting the test a quick and definitive indicator. They're very clever. Metal. That's really clever. I think that's great. That's fantastic stuff. Really nice. Case Western is a very progressive school with lots of good ideas. This episode of TWIP can be found at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Consider helping us out financially. Become a patron. Support us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And you can do Patreon or other ways as well. Send us your questions, comments, your case guesses. TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center, which is now called the Florence and Walter Irving Columbia Medical Center. They keep changing like the name. That. Thank you, you, Daniel. Thank you. Dixon de Pommier is everywhere. <laughs> Olivia, trichinella.org, verticalfarm.com, parasites without borders.org, actually, or.com. Him too. And so or. is Daniel. Com. Com. Parasites Actually, without borders. Both com. Daniel. Com. Now com. I can say Parasite. Daniel Griffin is not only at CMC, but he's at Parasites. Yes. Not without borders. borders. Yep. Dot com. What is the goal of Parasites Without uh, Borders? To never have to talk about parasites again. Let's wipe them out. So we can't do a twip. Uh, well, we could do a post. It'll become it'll become a historic historical. Though. Say twip. back before parasites. You're going to eradicate all right. parasitic infections. No, no we, we but not, we'd like no. to reduce their numbers in people. You want to make medical students more aware of parasites. We do. Right? I think that's the big thing is we want to disseminate information. That's we want to help educate. We want to get information about parasites um, to the people that need it the most. Exactly. And the main vehicle is the textbook, right? It is. And there's a companion series of lectures that are in, in process. And the works, and you go put those there. Because right now, the website itself is minimal. It just has a little bit of information, We've right? Got the twip. It's true. Twip. It's true. It's got all the twips. It's got mi- information on the big ones. It does. Mm-hmm. Malaria, it does. just the somes, et cetera, trypanosomiasis. But you can get the book there, and eventually you're going to have some, some We're going to have an online course. Very good. That's right. Very nice. And then after that, what's what's next? Who I knows? We shop this around and give it to as many people as we can. All right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins.
You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. You know, your middle name is Donald. I do know that. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's not my-